This is the Energy Education Podcast for Sunday, December 9th, 2012. I'm Kevin Hurley. This podcast is a project of Fairwinds Energy Education. Fairwinds is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to educate policymakers, the public, and the next generation on matters of nuclear power and safety. Today on the show, Global attention is back on Japan following an offshore earthquake measuring 7.3 on the Richter scale. We'll talk about this most recent quake. Also on the show, the Fukushima Daini reactor complex, only a few miles south of Daiichi, saw a rise in containment pressure during this most recent quake. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about difficulties TEPCO may have in removing the damaged fuel from the fuel pools. Joining us again this week is Fairwinds Chief Nuclear Engineer, Arnie Gunderson. All coming. Thanks for joining us this Sunday. It's December 9th, 2012, and you are listening to the Energy Education Podcast. As a quick reminder, we do want to hear from you. If you have any questions or comments that you would like Arnie to address here on the podcast, we want to hear them. You can do that by making a short audio recording and sending it to us in MP3 format. The email address is podcast at fairwinds.org. Now remember to introduce yourself with your first name and location. All submitted questions and comments should be about 30 seconds or less. Again, the email address is podcast at fairwinds.org. Also this December, Fairwinds is asking for your help. We rely on the generous contribution from listeners like you to continue moving energy education forward. This season, please consider helping us to reach our fundraising goal by making a tax-deductible donation. You can do so by visiting the Fairwinds donation page at fairwinds.org forward slash donations. Now let's get to it. Arnie, thanks for joining us here in the studio today. Hey, Kevin. Thanks for having me again. Well, let's get right to the main topic of conversation, the earthquake in Japan that happened uh, two days ago now. It was a 7.3 uh, on the Richter scale, and everyone's concerned about Unit 4 and Unit 3 in Fukushima Daiichi. Can you talk about this? Uh, yeah, it was a 7.3, but it was 150 miles offshore. So um, that means that the site didn't experience a 7.3 earthquake. You know, it's like throwing a, a, a pebble into a, a pond. At the center, the, the, the the blast when the pebble hits <laughs> is bigger, but then as the as the pebble moves out, the as the as the wave moves out, it's less, uh, less and less high. So the, the site was hit by a, a significant earthquake, uh, uh, but I wouldn't call it a severe earthquake. Probably not a 7.3 by the time it reached the plant, then you're saying. Yeah, I'm sure it was probably on the order of a 6. So what, uh, even with a 6.0 earthquake, I mean, the, plant, the buildings are unstable. It's still something to worry about. Uh, what did happen on site? Yeah, I, I've been saying if there's a 7.0 on site to worry about the structural integrity of the buildings. And I, and I still believe that, especially Unit 3 is the worst damaged building. And, of course, Unit 4 has the most nuclear fuel exposed. So there's a trade-off there. The, the, the most likely to fall is likely 3, but the, if it does fall, 4 would cause the uh, more severe uh, radiological releases. So, uh, but but that didn't happen, uh, which is which is good news. The, the, the fuel pools are still intact. Um, I don't believe that uh, what Tokyo Electric said is true. You know, they said, you know, "Don't worry, be happy, everything is fine." There's some indications of a of a problem in uh, in Unit One, where the um, this is that Fukushima Daiichi Unit One, where the um, hydrogen gas started to increase after the accident. It's still not at explosive levels, but it's gone up dramatically. There was another problem uh, down the road, five miles down the road at the Fukushima Daini site. And uh, that one in their unit, one there, they experienced a pressure increase inside the containment. No one's quite sure why that happened, but it was shortly after the earthquake. So it's you know, certainly a causal effect. And then um, Nikkei, the uh, news service, is reporting that at the uh, fuel processing plant, which is nowhere near the center of the earthquake, there was also a spike in um, in radiation releases. So, you know, these are problems that shouldn't happen, but they're not catastrophic. Mm-hmm. So Unit 4 is still standing. Everyone's big concern was Unit 4. Should people be worried at this point about the Fukushima site in Unit 4 specifically? 
Yeah, you know, I, I am still worried about the Fukushima site. And this earthquake, uh, 7.3, is likely not the biggest that can happen as an aftershock to the, the 9.3 that occurred. The example is if you go back to the Sumatra earthquake in uh, 2006 or 2007, that was a 9. And then uh, about 18 months afterward, there was a, uh, an 8.6 aftershock. So a 7-3 aftershock after a 9-3 earthquake certainly would be expected, and, and frankly, I think there'll be a, a worse aftershock sometime in the future, just a question of predicting when. Arnie, we've been talking about uh, Unit 4 and Unit 3 for quite some time and what threat they might pose to uh, Japan in the event of an earthquake. For the new listeners, can you just kind of go over that one more time? Why do we really have our eye on Unit 4 and Unit 3? Yeah, Unit 3 and Unit 4 were the most compromised structurally from the accident. The um, explosion in Unit 3 severely damaged its structure on top of the fact that it was hit by earthquakes and aftershocks. And the explosion in Unit 3 also damaged the structure over on Unit 4, plus the fact Unit 4 had its own explosions and earthquake and aftershocks. So those two buildings are the uh, structurally the weakest. The attention on Unit 4 is compounded because there's so much more nuclear fuel in the fuel pool at Unit 4. Unit 3 is, um, still has a lot of fuel in the pool, but in comparison, Unit 4 is worse. So that when you look at the trade-off here, it's the unit, unit 3 is more likely to collapse, but the consequences are less. Unit 4 is a little bit stronger, but the consequences are much more severe. And those consequences are? We'd be back to March 11th, 2011, if if Unit 4 were to collapse. You know, it would bring the country to its knees again and and cause a massive evacuations and and potentially become a global issue as well. It depends on on the fire. We're dealing with a fire that no one's ever seen before. You know, this, these fuel pool fires are postulated, and we showed the video of a lab, national lab demonstrating what a fuel pool fire would look like. But no one's ever done it, and hopefully no one ever will. But the amount of radiation here is equal to the amount of radiation that went up in all 700 nuclear above-ground tests for, for 40 years in, in one fell swoop. So it could be really serious. Well, that's a lot for the Japanese people to be thinking about every time the ground shakes. Yeah, you know, that's important to... to that the Japanese government really needs to internalize this. The, um, you know, they had, they had Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and, and the country got over it. They bought into the nuclear, the, the nuclear premise, even though they were, they were bombed and, and they had the black rain. And they believed and they trusted authority, but it happened. It happened again at, at Daiichi. And, you know, rather those, than those being bookends on the nuclear industry, you know, the, it began at, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and, and, and could end at, uh, at Daiichi for Japan, the Japanese government is now talking about doing it all over again for another 40 years. And you got to think about every time the earth shakes now, what are the Japanese going to be thinking? They're going to be thinking, oh my God, it, it can happen again. And it can. I mean, Japan is on the, on the rim of fire. And, and uh, that's, it's the, um, it only has a little tiny piece of land mass. It's only half a percent of all the land on the planet is in Japan. And yet they get 10% of all the earthquakes on the planet. So um, it's not a great site to, uh, to locate nuclear power plants. And on top of that, the half a percent of land that they've got is largely mountainous that nobody can use, which forces everybody into the, the coasts. And, that, and, of course, that's exactly where the nuclear plants are as well. So the, the island is a, is a bad test case for nuclear power in general. And um, you've got a sensitized population. And I don't think that's going to go away. I, I honestly believe that uh, every time the ground shakes for 40 years, if there's a nuclear plant running, the people are going to just you know, hold their breath and say, oh, my God, I hope that the, um, the OE plant or, or whatever rides, rides it out. That's a difficult psychological place to put your population. And I think the uh, Japanese government is just not anticipating 40 years of, of stress on their population if they continue to run these nuclear plants as they're proposing.
Arnie, earthquakes in general, measured on the Richter scale, my understanding is that this is an exponential scale. Can you talk about that? Yeah, uh, you're, you're right. It's uh, uh, not quite exponential, but it's, it's uh, darn near. And what that means is that the difference between an 8 and a 7 isn't 10 times or once or whatever. It's 30 times more powerful. Um, so, you know, let's, let's look at this 7.3 versus uh, the Sumatra 8.5. That's about 40 times more powerful. So the aftershock at Sumatra was 40 times more powerful than the, the earthquake that uh, Japan just experienced two days ago. And that's an aftershock. So we, we have to keep in mind that when you hear a Richter 7 compared to a Richter 8, that it's, um, you know, it's more than 10 times more powerful. On top of that, though, is the location of the earthquake and, and uh so when people heard Earthquake Japan, they automatically started calling and emailing Fairwinds, but they, um, they didn't look at where it was, which was like 150 miles away. So the ground acceleration of Fukushima Daiichi looked to me to be a couple inches compared to feet like in the, the previous earthquake. But what that means is um, I'm sure that components that were already damaged fell. You know, they'll go back in that building and things that were hanging on the ceiling are, are now have fallen on the floor. They weren't usable before and now they're certainly not usable. But it's almost like after a hurricane you get a lot of tree limbs that are still stuck in the trees. Well, the next storm that comes through, those tree limbs come down. You know, so the same thing is going to happen in each of the Daiichi units. They're going to see uh, damaged components uh, get more damaged or, or, in fact, fall to the floor. So while this most recent earthquake at the Fukushima Daiichi site didn't take down any buildings, it certainly doesn't make the problem any easier for the TEPCO workers and for the government workers to deal with. Moving down a few miles south, I think a few miles south, is the Fukushima Daini plant. You just spoke about an uh, increase in pressure in the reactor following this earthquake. Can you talk about Daini, though, two years ago? What happened to Daini uh, on the March 11, 2011 earthquake? Yeah, we talk about it extensively in the, in the video that's on the site. The, the video was called, uh, it could have been a lot worse. We talk about the loss of the ultimate heat sink. And the tsunami that knocked out um, the Daiichi cooling pumps also knocked out a lot of the cooling pumps at Daini then there's about six mile difference between those two sites. In particular, the pumps that cool unit one were, uh, were destroyed and the diesels for unit one didn't work. That implies there has to be core damage at uh, Daini unit one. And this is one of the big secrets that Tokyo Electric isn't talking about, is just how damaged is Fukushima Daini. They should also talk about just how damaged Fukushima Daiichi 5 and 6 are, but we're not hearing that either. But Daini uh, went for a, a period of time with, with no way to cool it. Uh, it had uh, no diesels uh, because of this loss of the ultimate heat sink. And, and now in this earthquake, we see an increase in pressure in the, uh, in the containment. These things are related. I'm not saying it's catastrophic, but I am saying that the, I, I think the... Scientists in this uh, scientific community need to get straight answers from Tokyo Electric. Let's not just look at Fukushima Daiichi 1, 2, 3, and 4. We need to look at Fukushima Daiichi 5 and 6, what happened to them, and then the, the Daini units as well. I think uh, Daini 1 is going to have core damage, and whether or not Daini 1 will ever start back up is, is, a, is a question that should be asked by energy planners, and I don't hear that on the screen, on the radar screens of, of people in Japan. Arnie, moving on, we have received a lot of emails lately about why TEPCO is putting covers over the fuel pools at the Fukushima Daiichi site. Why not just pull the fuel out as fast as possible? Yeah, I've been reading those too, and, and this is a great opportunity to talk about that for a couple of minutes. I was in the business of building nuclear fuel racks. And if you think of nuclear fuel as spaghetti, well, then the rack is the box that the spaghetti's in. And if the spaghetti is straight and the box is straight, you can turn it upside down and the spaghetti falls out easily. But if the box is dented or bent, or if the spaghetti isn't straight, you're not going to get the spaghetti out of the box. 
Well, the same thing holds for nuclear fuel. It's essentially spaghetti-like. It's 12 feet long, and, and it, the, each piece is about as big as a finger in diameter. And uh, I think it's pretty clear that the, the fuel racks at Daiichi have been damaged. You know, the, the, we had an earthquake on the opposite side of Japan in 2007 at the um, uh, Kashiwa, Kashiwazaki Kariwa plant, and they damaged their fuel racks. That was a bad earthquake, but it didn't have a tsunami with it. And it made it impossible to pull some of the fuel out of the rack at Kashiwa, uh, Kashiwazaki Kariwa. I was at uh, Niigata, uh, which is on the coast right near Kashiwazaki Kariwa, and a scientist said to me, you know, that was our last warning. That 2007 earthquake, we got through it. Everybody breathed a sigh of relief, but that was our last warning. And he was right. I mean, of course, it happened again four years later at, at Daiichi. So I think we can see that the fuel racks are going to be damaged. And what that means is the, the box of spaghetti is going to be dented. So when they go in to try to pull the fuel out, they're not going to be able to. Some of that fuel is going to be stuck, like spaghetti stuck in the box. And uh, an earthquake like this most recent one uh, likely caused more damage or it caused more crap to fall into the pool. And as particles fall into the pool, again, it's going to change the friction that's required to pull out this, this spaghetti in the box, to, to pull out the nuclear fuel. I think what they're going to see is um, uh, they go down with this long handle and try to grab the fuel on the top. And uh, uh, if the fuel is undamaged and the rack is undamaged, it slides out pretty easily. If the fuel is bent or if the rack is bent, it doesn't. So that what they can do is they can crank up the power and pull a little harder. The problem is that this is spent fuel, so it's brittle. And if they pull too hard, they're likely to, um, to snap the fuel and what that can mean is a gaseous release of radiation. So th that was a long prelude to answer your question. Why are they building these roofs over the fuel pool? Is that they're afraid that when they come to pull the nuclear fuel, they're going to snap some of the bundles and they're going to release radioactive gases. When they build that building over it, they then run that gases through a filter and then up the stack so that less radiation is released than, than would be to the public. So it's a vehicle to capture whatever radiation comes off the spent fuel as they're, um, as they're trying to pull it out. So this cover is put there to protect the public from radiation that may come off of the fuel pool when they're removing it. What dangers do the workers face? You know, there's been cases in the U.S. where um, a fuel pool area has had to be evacuated because a, a bundle broke. What happens is you get a burst of gases that come up into the, um, into the air right directly above it, and the, the, the people working on the fuel pool have to evacuate the building until the ventilation system sucks it out. Arnie, over a year ago we were talking about the potential of Unit 3 being, uh, the explosion at Unit 3 being a prompt criticality, and of course that would possibly have been caused by the distortion of the fuel rods, maybe one being slammed into the other or positioning or whatnot, is it possible when they're removing this fuel, they, might in, they may inadvertently create some kind of criticality? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, back last year, the water was pure water in the pool. And the only way they were absorbing neutrons was by panels in the nuclear fuel pool. It, it, it's essentially the, the sides of the spaghetti box were made of boron and they were designed to absorb neutrons. And, you know, I, I ran a business that uh, built fuel racks, and the, the dimensional tolerances are really critical. If you squeeze them too close together, uh, you'll get a criticality that you don't want, called a prompt moderated criticality. That's in pure water. Now, what Tokyo Electric has done since then is they poured boron into that fuel pool. Uh, and the fuel is only 5% enriched. So, it's unlikely that they could cause another criticality, not because the racks are any better, in fact, they're worse, but because in addition to whatever boron is left in the sides of the fuel pool canisters, in the, in the sides of the spaghetti box, if you will, um, in addition to that boron, 
that pool is so full of bora now that they has essentially probably doubled the amount. You know, we know, though, that the fuel is damaged. And the reason we know that is that the radioactivity in the fuel pool water is extraordinarily high. And it hasn't really come down over the last 18 months. Originally, people thought, well, maybe it was depo deposition from the explosions and it settled on the water. But they've been running these fuel pool cooling systems now for months and months and months, and we still see high levels of radiation in the spent fuel pools. So that tells me that uh, the fuel bundles themselves have been damaged, either by the earthquake or the explosion or by a prompt moderated criticality or by the aftershock. So there's exposed fuel in the pool right now. You know, if you think of this thing as um, uh, these long tubes of spaghetti, the tubes are zircaloid, the tubes are cracked. The now, whether they're rods. the fuel rods, the individual fuel rods are cracked right. uh, from either the seismic motion or the explosion or the rattling of the building from the explosion, th th they may be completely severed, but they're certainly cracked. We call that a weeper. And, uh, you know, depending on the length of the crack, the, the bigger the weep. I'm sure that you're going to find when they start pulling that spent fuel that they'll have a lot of weepers. They'll have a lot of damaged fuel. You know, and, and it's compounded because it's not, it's not clean water. It's salt water. This stuff was never designed to be in salt water. So you have hot, warm zircaloy in with boron and salt water, and there's all sorts of chemical reactions going. The thickness of this, this wall is only four hundredths of an inch to begin with. Arnie, what, what wall are you talking about? I'm talking about the, um, uh, the tube wall, the zircaloy tube that surrounds the uranium. That tube is only four hundredths of an inch thick. Now, we did a video way back in August of, of 2011 where we lit one of those on fire. It looks rigid because it's only about four inches, but in fact, it's, when it's 12 feet long, it's quite flexible because it's extraordinarily thin. And each tube weighs hundreds of pounds, so you've got a lot of weight in a very long, skinny tube. And when it starts to rattle, or when it's exposed to salt water, or when it's exposed to a, an explosion, the net effect is you're going to damage some of that fuel. Now, somebody said, why don't they just take this fuel and lift it out and put it right in dry casks and forget about it? That was an email just about a week or two ago. And the answer to it is the fuel is not in good condition. They're going to have to take this fuel and move it to another location that's more stable and then analyze it rod by rod to see which can be stored and which has to be uh, disassembled. And there's got to be a, a plan B here. So when you talk about one of those tubes weighing hundreds of pounds, you're talking not about the bundle. You're talking about one individual tube filled with uranium, zircaloy lined, weighs hundreds of pounds? The whole bundle weighs about 1,000 pounds, so that, that would be 8 by 8. So that would mean each bundle, each tube weighs uh, tens of pounds. So sure. that together the bundle weight comes in at 1,000 pounds. And on the top is a handle. So they come down, they grab that handle, and they pull. And, you know, it's sort of like you know, pulling up your zipper if your pants are too tight. You pull, 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 and all at once it'll come. Well, that's likely to be what's happening when they pull on this thing. If they pull all at once, it will, it will slide. And, of course, in the process, it's likely to cause damage. And um, that gets back to your original question. It started this whole riff here is that the reason they're covering those fuel pools is because as they're moving fuel, they're pretty surely going to be uh, releasing additional gases. And that if they put a cover over the building, they can then treat those gases before releasing them up their stack. Incredible job for the Japanese to accomplish, or an incredibly difficult job for the Japanese to accomplish. What lessons would you say this should be teaching us? Well, I think the, the lesson is that the, the downside for this technology is extraordinarily costly. Now, we really haven't evaluated in, this, in the United States the true cost of a, of a really severe accident. The, uh, the assumptions people use on these things are designed to minimize the, uh, the cost so that policymakers in the nuclear industry can show that nuclear is the, uh, the right way to go. But there, of course, is that magic word, assumption. And depending on what assumption you use, you know, you can push this answer to be very, very, very much in favor of building more nuclear power plants. I think that's what's happening in Japan.
My last question. Um, the word assumption, this is something we've used over and over again. This is a word that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uses when they're calculating anything from how far an evacuation zone should be to what? What does that mean when they talk about assumptions? Yeah, I think the NRC would couch their words and not call it assumption. They might call it the initial conditions or the, the starting conditions. You know, they, they basically assume that nuclear fuel leaks at a, at a, a certain rate. And they assume that the, once the fuel starts to leak, only a certain amount of radiation from the fuel gets in the water. And then they assume that when that water, that, that radiation in the water, only a small fraction of that gets released into the air. And then they assume that the building doesn't leak. So the problem, if I'm understanding, with all of these assumptions is they're calculating all of their final calculations based on assumptions which may or may not be true to begin with. Yeah, you're right. They're looking at a series of assumptions. The net effect of all of them is that it minimizes the consequences and it minimizes the probability of a nuclear accident. So if your calculations, they call it a PRA, a probabilistic risk assessment, if it shows that the chance of an accident is very small, and even if it happens, the consequences are very low, then from a policy position, it's worth building more nukes. You know, the problem is when you look at those assumptions, each one of them is, is not in the middle of the road, but is, 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 is favorable to um, the, 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 the people that want to build nuclear power plants. The, the key assumption is that I was at an advisory committee and reactor safeguards meeting, and the NRC staff said that we were talking about a really geeky topic called net positive suction head. But the NRC staff came out and they said, we assume the containments do not leak. Now, Daiichi showed clearly that that was not the case. But in fact, uh, Dave Lockbaum, a Union Concerned Scientist, me, the state engineer for, the, uh, for Vermont, we were all lobbying for years to get that assumption thrown out. Since 2005, we were lobbying the NRC that that was a poor assumption. And when you figure there's hundreds of these in a calculation, just that one example, containments don't leak, of course that's going to push the policy decision that, uh, that the technology is safe. So by making that one assumption, it changes the entire calculation. It changes the entire outcome. That's right. You know, there's one other uh, example of an assumption that we all make. Our listeners and, and watchers of the Fairwind site assume we're going to be there. We'd, uh, we'd like to keep it up next year and, and years into the future. This, it's not a given. We need, uh, we need donations. It's the end of the year and uh, tax time, and uh, this is a good time to minimize your tax and help a good cause at the same time. So you know, we'd really appreciate uh, viewer contributions, listener contributions, so that we can all make the assumption that Fairwinds will be there in 2013. Arnie Gunderson, thanks for coming on the podcast today. Hey, Kevin, thanks for having me.